medicine is made for you. And the speaker is Professor Dean Ho, who is the director of the Institute for Digital Medicine and director of the N1 Institute for Health. He's also head of the Biomedical Engineering uh, Department at NUS. Uh, Dean is very well known for his work on Curate.ai, a powerful AI platform for personalized treatments. And Dean is a fellow of the US National Academy of Inventors, American Association for Advancements of Science, the American Institute for Medical and Biological Sciences, and also the Royal Society of Chemistry. Uh, Dean, please. Thank you so much. Hope everybody can hear me okay. I wanted to thank our organizers uh, and to thank all the attendees for being here today. And it's uh, always good to see uh, uh, Lim Soon and Zhuo Wei. Uh, we're, we're virtual today, but uh, it's good to see everybody. And again, I wanted to thank the organizers and the yeah, attendees. To so uh, today um, I'm going to be talking about a topic that we call medicine made for you. Um, I think that uh, for everybody attending today, the, the fields of personalized and precision medicine um, have really boomed over the past uh, several years, and we're now really as a community starting to see some really amazing impact for patients. And today I'm going to talk about a, a, a bit of a different way that we approach this challenge and also talk about the community, uh, the, the amazing ecosystem that we have here um, at NUS, as well as our surrounding partners to really, truly bridge innovation that we create in-house and to bring it all the way to patients. And I think to start things off, what's quite exciting is uh, to, to link with um, the, 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 the previous talk, which is really exciting, by the way. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about our uh, institute here and, and those who make uh, the work happen. Um, and to really kind of uh, imagine what multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary research can look like when our objective is to truly bridge this in-house innovation all the way to interventional patient impact. And when I say interventional, and you'll, you'll, you're, you're going to hear this word often today, it's treatment-based technology. It involves a wholly different team for regulatory, for implementation, for behavioral, and beyond. And if we look at the team that makes this happen, this is actually a partial representation. We have many others who have since joined. I wanted to highlight a couple of individuals. Uh, Dr. Nyam Ki Yuen, who is uh, uh, an amazing clinician and is really helping to build the backbone of our AI platform at the health system. Uh, Poonam, who's in our administrative team, who drives a lot of our partnerships uh, with other labs, with other clinical institutions, and with other companies, and then this amazing team of researchers. And one of the first people to join our, our Institute for Digital Medicine is Johan Sapinel, who actually hails from insurance. Right? We brought him in first to help us prioritize how we launch our clinical programs to ensure that they not only make it to patients, but that there's a chance for scale and there's a chance for true widespread adoption, right? True adoption. And this is where the payer perspective matters. We have expertise in biomaterials, AI and optimization, supercomputing, nanotech. Uh, human performance and cognitive performance and this amazing team of behavioral scientists. And I will add that UC Keppo, who was actually featured in the previous presentation, works closely with us to explore things like operations analytics when we think about how to scale and deploy and to really bridge with er other areas too, like healthcare economics, et cetera. So when we talk about interdisciplinary research, we move beyond technology and medicine, which again are the core, but to look at behavioral, implementation, economics, payer, and beyond. And that's what really makes this a special entity. All right, so I'm just gonna quickly go over an outline of what the challenges of achieving medicine made for you are and what medicine made for you means for us. Go over a couple of real use cases, human studies that we do, and then looking forward to what's next, right? So medicine made for you. Precision medicine, personalized medicine, what is this traditionally meant? Well, uh, there's a lot of discussion of how we really do bring personalized care to patients. And again, it means different things to different communities, all of which are important. One of the first things is hoping to deliver the right drug at the right dose at the right time, 
for patients. But I think we have to dig a little bit deeper now as we look at the next phase of the fields. How do we pick the right drugs, right? How, how do we actually, what methodologies do we use to truly pick the right drugs for the patients? And when we say right dose, what does right dose mean? And there's something that I want to emphasize, which is for even a single patient, the right dose today may not be the right dose tomorrow for that patient. It may not be the right dose next week for that patient. And in an even more complex manner, and some, this is something I will also repeat, even if you do in fact pick the right drugs, but the right dose is not there, there can actually be no efficacy for the patient. The, uh, one of the prevailing views is if you pick the right drugs for a patient, even if the doses are wrong, they'll work to some extent. But the reality of what we've seen in human is that even the right drugs given at the wrong dose can have no efficacy. And what that means is a misperception that these drugs cannot work for the patient. And when we talk about things like oncology, time matters. And so what I'm actually saying is just by adjusting the dose, patients can switch from not responding to treatment to responding just by changing the dose. And that is a pivotal finding that will help us find more responders to care. And the third item is right time. What is the right time? This all meshes together to tell us that we know that everybody's different from each other. That's something we all know, right? No two patients are alike, but it is essential to note that even a single patient can be different from themselves over time. And so the ability to understand how to dynamically treat patients is essential. So how do we solve this challenge? Our solution is the digital avatar. What you're looking at is actually a person, right? This is a person. And this, what looks like something that's purely computational is based on actual data from the patient. What I'm gonna show you today, everything I'm gonna show you today, we do not take pre-existing patient data from a, from a population to feed an algorithm to, tr to treat the next person that walks in the door. We use only a patient's own data to dynamically optimize and personalize only their own care. True N of one. Only a patient's own data to modulate only their own care. So what do we do with this? This curve lets us do two things, all right? This, if we can get a patient sample, whether it's a biopsy or whatnot, we can use this to design a combination only for that patient and we can do it quickly. But once we design that combination, we have to know how to dose it and that dosing can be dynamic. And so with this digital avatar, which again is not computational, we can use this for many indications. It is mechanism independent. We correlate drugs and dose all the way to true efficacy. It's not PK based, it's mechanism independent and it can be broadly applied. All right, so I'm gonna go a little bit deeper into what this means, but. I want to reemphasize something. Different patients, their various situations, they're all unique and not all of these challenges have the same solution. It is important to move beyond population-driven medicine to treat the next person that walks in the room. And you're actually looking at two pictures drawn by my kids, right? I asked them to draw, hey, they know what a, a parabola is. They've seen my work enough but I asked them to draw me a parabola. And as expected, their parabolas looked different from each other. And what you're about to see is that we can use approaches like this to guide treatment for patients, but even a patient's own parabola will change over time. No two patients are alike, but even the same patient is different from themselves over time. All right, to emphasize that fact, I'm gonna reemphasize that we use only a patient's own data to manage only their own care. We do not use pre-existing big data. We use small data. And I want to emphasize that big data is still important, all right? It's, it's actually vital for diagnostics in particular. What I'm going to talk about today, again, is intervention, how to dynamically intervene for patients. That's why we use small data, because we need specific data to drive this process, not large amounts. But again, over time, we will acquire more data. So in fact, our approach, which I'll get into later, is quite complementary to big data-based approaches as well. We work hand-in-hand -hand with communities that work in big data. 
especially when we start to think about what drugs should we even look at for a patient. Big data matters for that. Again, good drugs, wrong dose, can be the misperception of no efficacy. That's critical. We do not want to miss patients that can respond. And what you're looking at, actually, are live drug interaction maps based upon real data. And this is actually from a rodent. It's the only rodent data I will show today. And this is a rodent over the course of treatment. The way that their drugs interact is dynamic. So in order to preserve synergy between the drugs, doses have to be adjusted dynamically. And no two rodents were alike. Just like, as I'll show you, no two humans are alike over time. All right, so I'm going to give a couple use cases. First one is transplant. This is our first in human trial that we ever did using this approach. And I'm going to emphasize this is a dose optimization trial. We did not determine the drugs for the patients. All the patients, by the way, had different sets of drugs because these are transplant patients. But what are the challenges in transplant? Transplant, this is the first in human. Right now, the measure of prevention of rejection, it actually is based on trough level. It's actually still based on PK, right? And I'll show you more examples later that are based on actual efficacy. In the case of transplant, if you give too much immunosuppressant, the patients can have neurotoxicity. They can have seizures uh, and, and, and other, uh, other challenging outcomes. If the dose is too low, they can reject the organ. So it's important to hit targets for these patients. And these targets are assigned by the clinicians. What you're looking at here is an example of one patient, and this is actual data, and this was a prospective interventional trial, which means this is not a retro analysis. We were actually treating these patients with our clinical team. This is a week one, week two, week three, week four, ABCD, four weeks, and you can see just looking at how the interaction of just two of the many drugs they were on, you can see this is dynamic. So that if you want to hit a target range, for example, here, if you keep at the fixed dose, you're going to be way out of target. But I, I'm going to emphasize, this is not surprising. Okay, it's not surprising because in transplant, clinicians are titrating, changing the doses every day. In fact, if one day the trough is too high, they'll drop the dose the next day. If the trough is too low one day and they fear rejection, they'll increase the dose. But here's the challenge. These patients are on 14 drugs at the same time, sometimes. And there's cases where if the trough is too low, the doctors will increase the dose a little bit, but it'll completely overshoot the target. Or if the trough is too low, they fear rejection and they increase the dose, it can actually go even lower the next day. The trough can actually go even lower. There's a lot happening with these patients. And so simple titration based on levels, not enough. So here's a snapshot of three different patients on the trial. And you can see they totally look different from each other at any given time, not surprising. I'm gonna talk a little bit about this trial. It's a small cohort trial. Our arm had higher average MELD scores, which means our patients were actually sicker. It was a randomized study, but our patients were discharged about a month earlier compared to standard care. Uh, at UCLA, uh, where we ran this trial, these patients um, are in, can be in the ICU for a long time, for months. And for those familiar with US healthcare, when ICUs can cost about $20,000 a day, getting them out a month earlier can be significant, but it's not just saving money. These are immunosuppressed patients, and we are getting them out of ICUs where they can actually die from community-acquired infections, right, because of their immunosuppression. So we are getting these patients out faster, even though discharge is not a standard endpoint. But at the same time, we outperform control in every metric, time within target, time out of target, et cetera. So this was a very important first in human validation of using this optimization approach. All right. Let's talk about cancer. After we published that paper, we were approached by a patient's team, uh, and this patient had stage four cancer, um, was about to quit their last treatment option because of toxicity. In oncology, patients often get high dose and they get fixed dose, and they move them to something else when they stop responding. Our goal is N of one dosing. And what does that mean? Well, this patient, stage four prostate cancer, uh, we obtained some data from this patient uh, by, because they had a lot of dose changes. Okay, so what do we need to drive this curate process? We need variable doses from which we then look at efficacy, which is PSA, prostate-specific antigen. And you can see we were able to plot, there was enough dose changes to obtain this curve for the patient. 
we get a lot of questions. Where's the AI? What does this curve mean? Okay, so back in the day, we ran studies uh, on cells at the time to show that if you expose cells to different permutations of different drugs, as well as different doses, that when the neural nets could show when we were trying to drive this towards an optimal outcome, which is to kill off the cancer cells or to block infection, that it was a nice and smooth surface. And these smooth surfaces appeared for basically every type of disease indication, infectious diseases, different cancers, inflammatory disease, metabolic disease, all of the above, all smooth surfaces, but they all looked different from each other, different indications. Um, then we thought, hey, you know, do we even need the neural nets at this point? The neural nets showed us the smoothness, but can we actually look at second order? Because if that's the case, we need even less data to drive this process. And lo and behold, this was a neural net discovered, now AI-based, because at this particular point, the AI effectively evolved itself out of the equation because for clinical implementation, we need this to be actionable. We need this to be quick. We need it to be dependable. And so what you're looking at, at the end of the day, what we need is the variable dosing for this patient to solve their curve. What happened when we did this for the patient? We found that they needed a 50% reduction in the dose of one of their drugs to increase efficacy. Imagine going to an oncologist saying, hey, let's drop the dose for the patient to increase efficacy. As expected, the answer was no, we're not gonna do that. The patient said, you know, uh, I have no more options. I can't tolerate, where do I sign? How do I sign the waivers to try this? And we tried it, got the approvals, and within about a week or two, the patient had their lowest PSA levels they'd ever seen. We took that single data point, put it back into this, and it said, keep the same curve. And at that low dose, the PSA went down even more in imaging confirmed stable disease. And the patient resumed a normal lifestyle. In oncology, dose changes only occur due to toxicity. And when that happens, it's always a reduction. You can never go back up on the dose. But in this particular case, the patient already had a fairly low dose. We went even lower. And then over time, we started dynamically dosing the patient all within safe ranges, never near maximum tolerated dose. Beyond it being cool that at a lower dose, you can increase efficacy, this is actually a much more profound change to practice than we thought. This was dose change based on efficacy not dose change based on toxicity. That is a paradigm shift for how cancer is treated. But again, we are doing this at the right dose at the right time because the dose changes dynamically. Since then, we've had more patients come in. Patient in Singapore who was no longer responding to any treatment. Any dose of any drug immediately readmitted to the hospital and near liver failure. We developed a calibration protocol for this patient where we were starting to modulate and give them variable doses. We needed three. And even before we finished the calibration, we started low, we started ramping up. The patient not only responded to care, their lung metastases, this is a gastric cancer patient with metastasis to the lung. They started cavitating their tumor, right? We started seeing response to their tumor. We actually ran a parallel cost saving study. We saved this patient over $10,000 due to reduced cost of the therapy plus uh, reduced readmission. This patient was being readmitted every time they got any drug. We found another option for this patient. And we're starting to look more deeply at saving the patients and the healthcare system money while delivering a better outcome for the patient. Our most recent study led by Dr. Agata Blasiak uh, and our team, senior research fellow, as well as Raghav Sundar and many others from NCIS, our, our Cancer Institute. We ran a formal trial where we recruited patients and we started pre-calibrating every patient recruited into this trial. And in this particular trial, different from the prostate study, we had a patient in particular who appeared to not respond to treatment. No response. It's not toxicity. It's no response. But because we allow, we were allowed to give them variable dose, there was some evidence that we could a lower dose could work. Once we dropped the dose, the patient flipped from not responding to responding just by a simple dose change. The clinical team was amazed because 
that they were going to move on to another treatment for this patient. And the amount of time, valuable, high quality of life time that could have been lost could have been substantial. So good drugs, wrong dose is the misperception of no efficacy. Switching from non-responder to responder. So the question is, can we find more responders to treatment? Our goal is not to low dose every cancer patient. That is not our goal. Our goal is to find more patients who can potentially respond to treatment. All right. So the final use case before I move into the future is infectious diseases for both HIV, SARS-CoV-2. Infectious diseases, a field that deserves more attention. This is going to be a very simple demonstration. 10 patients, HIV. Patients are often given one of the drugs in their combination that uh, can actually lead to kidney failure. They actually can die from kidney failure, not from HIV. We found lower doses for this drug that preserved uh, undetectable viral load. Again, using the same approach across 10 patients. A while back, way before COVID started, I put a team together of engineers, including UC from NUS Business, as well as epidemiologists from around the world, uh, to look at developing a rapid drug optimization platform, a rapid combo design approach to look at combinations in case we are ever confronted with a pathogen where we don't know how to respond, where there's no existing drugs. And from our paper, not only did we validate a technology approach, we actually put some commentary into the paper that in the event of extraordinary circumstances, which means a pandemic, the rapid development of treatments is essential because industry and healthcare systems will be overwhelmed, right? We, we started this study in 2019. Uh, we, we, there was no COVID at the time. We actually validated this in a different RNA virus. But of course, when COVID happened, thanks to an amazing community here in Singapore, we were able to look at the live virus and we started publishing validation work on this. Okay, so this is not purely computational. We need live virus to, we crowdsource the live virus with various permutations of combinations. With a pool of 10, 12 drugs, you're looking at hundreds of millions of possible combinations because you have to incorporate dose in there as well. We, with a small number of experiments, interrogate the live virus and extrapolate out a ranked list of best all the way to worst combinations. And this list is comprised of the best ranked combinations all the way to the worst. And we did this for wild type. We did this for beta, delta, and now Omicron. And we were able to not only establish promising combinations, but our ranking, which is experimentally driven, strongly aligns with clinical outcomes. It's only in vitro, live virus. It aligns with clinical outcomes without requiring any data from these clinical trials. And we get this done within weeks. For pandemics, we don't have the same amount of time for, for on, as oncology as a comparison. We cannot wait a year to find that a drug fails when instead we can not only prioritize drugs with this approach, with identify, as we call it, we can deprioritize drugs as well. And we've since moved on to antimicrobial resistance, which is a pressing matter around the world. And we may move into monkeypox quite soon, just as continued validation for the approach. And where to next? Other countries have written clinical protocols based upon our platform identify. We have developed an online database where clinicians can go in and say, hey, look, if I have a patient who cannot take this drug, what combinations can I develop for this patient based on your data? We've even made a comic book. For those interested, go to n1labs.org. We have a comic book with many people at NUS. Our, our, our amazing community helped us put this together. We actually developed this book well over three years ago. Aiden and Eileen versus Vinny the Virus. Have a read. It's a free download. Um, and, and hope you enjoy. This is one of our ways to communicate what we do to the community. And we since have collaborations and service across and, and, and philanthropic support from a number of entities, which we're grateful for. Final quick one I'm going to go into is I've talked entirely about pharmacologic intervention, pills, medicines, traditional medicines, right? Um, where to next? Um, I'm going to just very quickly highlight that now, instead of just dynamically dosing dose, we're also looking at digital therapeutics. What is digital therapy? It is software as intervention, right? And in this case, we're using software for cognitive training, multitasking tools. This is a NASA developed game, open sourced, which we have since modified, where we modulate not a dose, because this is software. You play a game, we modulate the difficulty. 
you can almost treat this as a triple combination therapy. And each one we on the back end modulate difficulty. And from this, we use software as treatment for things like cognitive decline, patients who've had surgery, brain cancer patients, seniors, healthy subjects, and beyond. This is an example of a study we did of different patients who, again, changed over time. We show that no two participants are alike. Some people thrive under high intensity one day, but then low intensity the next. It is quite a dynamic process. And we've since scaled this up and run hundreds of subjects now. And why are we doing this? As we talk about increasing cost of care, um, it's important to start thinking about how we can move care out of hospitals and into the home. As we all know, there's an aging challenge. And so we actually reimagined the game. It actually looks more complex, but we brought in an, a former animator from Lucasfilm to work with our users to co-design a different way to deploy this game on tablets. And this is done by an amazing team we have of Dr. Alex, Vivian Smriti, Marlena, Bina, and Yoan. Their expertise spans uh, digital, spans behavioral sciences, biomedical engineering, serious gaming and payer. Truly a diverse team. We've launched some landmark trials for brain cancer patients, obtained feedback from those patients to make sure we can sustain this intervention remotely, right? To make sure people stick with it. And it's quite an exciting digital therapeutics program that we have. So I'm gonna conclude the talk with a, couple, with a couple notes, right? I think personalized medicine is an evolving field. And I think what we're hoping to do is to redefine it through some other examples of dynamic personalized medicine. It's not always about how much data we have, it's how it's acquired, right? We, we do variable intervention, variable dosing correlated to efficacy to drive how we make these avatars, which themselves can be dynamic. We have multiple use cases that have been validated and larger trials en route. And then I ask you, you know, ask everybody what's next. And so I, why do I show these plants, right? And so here you're looking at spinach, which we've actually been growing. You know, for, for, for COVID, that's an example where we, we can agnostically optimize combinations to prevent infection. Why can't we develop combinations to go the other direction, right? To make things grow more or to grow faster, to increase yield. The context of food security, we actually validated this. We developed a platform where we can optimize ingredients in soil to not only increase yield, wet and dry, dry weight, but to also show that the nutritional content is unchanged. Imagine using less agents, less ingredients to both increase yield and not to change nutritional content, which we know via global warming is a problem. We're not purely computational. This We use the actual validation to make this happen, All right? So that's where we're on to next. Final slide I'm gonna show, I'm not gonna go over all these numbers and all this complexity. Our institutes, Institute for Digital Medicine or Wisdom or N1, our outcome is how many patients we impact. Impact is a widely used word. We validate our impact by establishing actual registered trials for everything from digital therapy to oncology all the way to brain cancer patients, which is a study we've just gotten approved. We're going after now the hardest to treat cancers using our approach. This is our measure of our outcome. Finally, I want to acknowledge everybody that supports this work, an amazing team of collaborators. Again, I wanted to thank the organizers and the attendees today. It's a privilege to be part of the NUS community here. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, actually, I, 